Thank you for praying with us. Um, If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to be opening to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, as we continue our series that we're calling The Way, a phrase that we find in the book of Acts in connection with the early followers of Jesus. This idea of the way, last week we considered Jesus' declaration. Uh, These were Jesus' words uh, where he, he declared that he was the way, that he is the way, the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. And, and he, he shows us in, in one of the, the most uh, known sermons that Jesus presented in Matthew chapter 5. He, he, he starts with this, this way being a way of blessing. And we looked at that last week, that, that Jesus' way is a, is a way first and foremost of, of blessing. Not, it doesn't first start off with his do's and his don'ts. There's some of those. But, but he starts with blessing. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And this is how his declaration begins. And so today, I, I want us to consider what it looks like to align with the Jesus way in a world that has maligned the way. Uh, in the book of Acts, we get some insight into several of the New Testament letters. Uh, so, for instance, if you're looking in Acts chapter 13 and 14, uh, if you want to just flip through there real quickly, you're welcome to. But in Acts 13 and, and 14, this is Paul's first missionary journey. And he, he focuses on spreading the, the gospel in, in the province of Galatia. So if you're already following along, then then you know that if if you read Paul's letter to the Galatians, it would be good for you to go back to Acts 13 and 14 and just to get some of the context of of what it is that you're reading into. Acts chapter 16, Paul goes to Philippi. And this is the origin story of the Philippian church. And so if you're reading the book of Philippians, it's good to, to flip back to Acts chapter 16 and you can see the origin story of this church and get some context. In Acts chapter 17, uh, Paul is in Thessalonica, or as they pronounce it in Greece, Thessaloniki. Also goes to Berea. So you're already following along. If if you're reading Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, you you go to to Acts 17 to get some context of of how that church was formed and and birthed. And and then we get to uh, Acts chapter 18. This is on Paul's second missionary journey, and he goes to Corinth. Yes, so Corinthians, those letters to the Corinthians, be good to look at Acts chapter 18. At the end of his second missionary journey, Paul spends a week in Ephesus, which really sets up his third missionary journey, where he's going to make Ephesus his ministry base for about three years. And so in Acts 19, Paul goes to Ephesus. He tells some believers about the Holy Spirit. He baptizes them and they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 8 of Acts chapter 19, here's what we read on the screen. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. The one he was following, the way, Jesus, spoke more about the kingdom of God than anything else, at least in the recorded words that we have in Scripture. And so Paul, who is, who is carrying the way with him, is, is now speaking about the kingdom of God. In verse 9, but some of them became obstinate. You looked up the word obstinate lately in the dictionary? Obstinate is stubbornly refusing to change one's opinion. I'm so thankful that I serve at a church where there is no obstinate people here. Obstinate. There was obstinate people in verse 9. And they refused to believe and they publicly maligned, not aligned, maligned the way. The New King James Version and the ESV says that they spoke of the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years. 
so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. This is the, the first takeaway that I wanted to just take, make a quick note of, is that we are to hear the word of the Lord. Uh, this morning as we gather on stage, those who are up serving today gather every week before the service starts to pray and I'm so thankful the, to, just to hear the prayer of, of our, our, one of our prayer team members who, who prayed, Lord, let us, let us all become students of your word. So if you weren't standing earlier, if you weren't on stage earlier as a student or a teacher or a faculty member, guess what? <laughs> You're not exempt. There, there's a calling on your life to be a student of the Word of God. And I'm so thankful for that reminder during our time of prayer this morning. The hall of Tyrannus, Scripture says, where Jews and Greeks went to hear philosophers and speakers debate. You'll see a picture of the library of Celsus in Ephesus, where Laney and I were just a few months ago. Lord willing, we plan to take a, a group here next year uh, you'll hear some more information about that in the coming weeks. But this is one of the, the most marvelous architecture structures in Ephesus. If you go there today, you, you'll see it. And it's one of the only remaining examples of great libraries of the ancient world located in the Roman Empire. It was the third largest library in the Greco-Roman world behind only those of Alexandria and Pergamum. But Paul uses his efforts in the hall of Tyrannus. You'll see in the next slide where scholarship believes the, the Hall of Tyrannus may have been, right next to the Library of Celsus. We don't know that for sure, but there's, there's, some, there's some indicators that that could have been the place where this Hall of Tyrannus was located. And he used his efforts in this Hall of Tyrannus as a part of a movement to raise up transformational Christ followers during a very key moment in history. This past year, our staff and some of our shepherds and some of our members uh, participated in what we call a discipleship cohort, just a, a small group who encourage each other by sharing how God is transforming their lives through, through scripture, uh, through prayer, and through mission. And as we listen to God through prayer and scripture, we begin to recognize his presence in ordinary places in which we find ourselves, and those spaces can become a space for God's mission in the world. In the book, Discipleship Cohorts, the authors suggest this. A mission space is any public space where you can spend time, encounter others, and look for God's activity. It can be a park, a coffee shop, a shopping center, a neighborhood, a restaurant, a library, or just about anywhere. And as you, as you spend time there, you pray for and in the space. Listen to what is going on and observe the movements of people, and more importantly, observe God's activity there. We have come to believe, the authors say, that God is at work in people and places all around us in ways that we often ignore or overlook. So we want to learn to pay attention and attend to God's movement, looking for ways to join him in his work. Uh, I'm convinced that there are uh, modern day halls of Tyrannus all across our city. The Hall of Tyrannus was, was not a church. It, it, was, it was a place where God's activity was, was happening. And, and it, was, it was a place where folks went and gathered. So wherever you're listening to my voice, it, it, there's, there's a Hall of Tyrannus somewhere around you. And I'm convinced that they are in our midst. The question is, are we willing to step into them and see what God is up to? God does extraordinary miracles through Paul in the next few verses. So a Jewish priest named the seven sons of Sceva tried to make some kind of new formula. They would say to a, to a person who was possessed, they would say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. They, they had seen some of this activity and they began to, to try to make it a formula that they could, could monetize. 
And so in verse 15, one day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Makes you think twice about maligning the way. (laughs) Verse 17, "When, when this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the Lord and the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. So just this is the second takeaway. It just jumped off the pages of Scripture to me this week. Hold the name of Jesus in high honor. Students, listen to me. You're going to have an opportunity this week. To hold the name of the Lord in high honor. In your workplace, in your home, not just the students, every one of us, we're going to have an opportunity to to hold the name of the Lord Jesus in high honor. 50,000 drachmas worth of burned books. Think of what you make in one year, think about your annual salary. Now multiply it by 100. A drachma was about a a day's wage. John's already doing the math. Multiply it by 100. Let's just say you make let's just say you make $10,000 a year. Multiply it by 100, that's a million dollars. A million dollars worth of books burned. Burned in one day. What practice in your life is not honoring Jesus? Is your money spent on your kingdom or his? Are your words honoring Jesus? Your words with your friends, your words with your family members, your words with your children? Is your time consumed with scrolling? Does this screen get more of your attention than anything else? The Ephesians burned their scrolls because it was distracting them from Jesus. Who among us needs to surrender your scroll? The Lord convicted me this week with all the busyness of school about to start back. And Jesus' words from John chapter 15, where he says, Apart from me, you can do nothing. I don't remember a lot about what preachers have said over the years. My guess is you won't remember a lot of what I say even today. But I remember before I even stepped in the preaching role here at at Homewood, we had a guest speaker several years ago. He stood right down front and he said, you know, my life just gets so busy and so, so crazy, and there's just so much going on. And so I, I, I normally, my normal practice, he said, was that I pray for an hour a day. But he said, when my life just gets busy and crazy and so much going on, he said, I, I, I asked my mentor, you know, what should I do when my life gets so busy? You know, I normally pray for an hour a day, but what should I do when, when my life gets so busy and so crazy? And his mentor told him, pray for two hours a day. And the point wasn't about time. It wasn't about the amount of time. That wasn't the, that wasn't the point. Some of you are thinking, an hour a day? I, I could never pray for an hour a day, let alone two hours a day. What are you, what are you talking about, preacher? The, the point is not the time. The point is your heart. Are your affections, are, are they postured toward following Jesus? And if not, what is distracting you from doing that? The word that was embedded into my spirit this week was the word abide. Brian talked about a 
song in communion talks. One that came to my mind this, this week was Abide in Me. And so I went searching for a prayer guide. Sometimes I, I just I look for something to kind of shake it up a little bit. And so I went searching for a prayer guide. And, and I found a, a back-to-school prayer guide by a lady named Mae Patterson. And when I found this, I didn't know if, if Mae even lived in our country. I mean, she could, have, she could have been on another continent for all I knew. But I decided uh, to reach out to her. I emailed May, and, and I just said, hey, do you mind if I get a copy of your prayer guide? And she said, sure, I, I'd, I'd be happy to share it with you. And by the way, where are you from? She said, I'm from Huntsville, Alabama. I said, really? And she said, yeah, and I, I grew up going to the Mayfair Church of Christ. I said, Really? And she said, yeah, and I, I see your tagline. One of, one of my good friends is Cherry DeRosa from your church who serves on your prayer team. Really? <laughs> so one, one of the things that began, it was just like God just kind of smiling down. It, but it was one of those things, it, it, just, it just hit me. You know, we, my family doesn't have time not to do this. We can't afford not to do it. So we've been gathering various times the past few days going through this this prayer guide parents if you'd like a, a copy of it they're out there in the foyer today you can grab one on your way out at the children's ministry desk or at the foyer desk if you if we run out of copies we'd be happy to email you one but just seven days what what a difference seven days can make in someone's life my family's committed to this time of prayer it may use the acronym school you'll see that on the screen so day one is we're praying for success. Proverbs 16.3 says, commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. I really like how the King James Version says it. It says, commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts, thy thoughts shall be established. Who knows that we need some established thoughts in this world? Day two is C. Connection to God and others, John 15, 4, remain in me and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And then here it is in verse 5, what was embedded in my spirit this week say, apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus says. Day three is, is honor. First Peter 2, 17, respect everyone, love the family of believers, fear God and respect the king. Show honor to those around you. Day four, open minds, Philippians 4 and 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Everybody should have, if you're going to use your phone, everybody should have a, a, a note in your, in, on your phone that just says Philippians 4.8. And you just, you just list things that are worthy of, of thinking about. Open hands, day five. Acts 20, 35, and everything I did, I showed you that by this kind and hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself who said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Hold that thought. We're coming back to it. Day six, leadership, Mark 10, 43 and 44. Whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. And then day seven, it's not a second L. That's not a misspelling. She really has a heart there. Um, but the second L is love, all of it. First John 4, 18, there's no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. What if every person in this room or listening to my voice committed to praying this for the next seven days? Whether you have kids in school or not, whether you get a prayer guide or just take a picture of this screen right now and you just commit the next seven days that you're, you're going to be praying for these things as a faith family. We fast from something. Maybe you fast from a meal this week. Maybe you fast from social media. Maybe you fast from YouTube Reels and Netflix. But be warned, it's coming. What's coming? The enemy will not be happy. Just like in Acts 19, 23, about that time there arose a great disturbance about what? About the way. Some folks made a lot of money making shrines to the goddess Artemis, and now people are burning scrolls and getting rid of idols, and so a riot breaks out in Ephesus. And what, what's Paul doing? He's, he's on the scene. He's trying to clear up. He's trying to restore their picture of Jesus. What happens when the, when the picture of Jesus in your heart grows dim? 
It gets confused by layers that tend to accumulate over the, over the years, the, the layers of guilt, the layers of distraction, the layers of busyness and unbiblical doctrine. And maybe you grew up hearing sermons every week that ended with a call to feel sorry for your sin and try harder to do better. Don't mishear me. Repentance is a wonderful gift from God. But the problem is that some of us never went beyond that to talk about the power available in Christ to actually change. Church, the try harder gospel is no gospel at all. And so when Paul baptizes the people in the name of Jesus, they receive the Holy Spirit. And all that time they've been trying to live the Christian life in their own power and now they, they have something more, the, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And, and they soon discover that Jesus is not some genie in a bottle that is, is someone whenever you want to wish to come true. The gospel is not about some technique. It's not about learning formulas so you can pull God's strings. It's about you allowing God to pull your strings. It's about you yielding to him, not the other way around. And for some, you may be here today and your picture of Jesus has become fuzzy. If your picture of religion is one that says, try harder, do better, come back next week, my friend, you have been duped. The good news of Jesus is that what you can't do, he's done. It is finished. And his grace is ready to be the game changer in your life. I was reminded about that in a real way this week, and you can be too. We're going to land the plane with Acts chapter 20. The very next chapter, Paul encourages the disciples before leaving Ephesus. He travels around. He preaches until midnight in Acts chapter 20. The word says that he talked on and on and on, which you may think that I do from time to time. But, but then Eutychus not only falls asleep, but he falls right out of the window. He dies. And Paul restores him right before they break bread, right before communion. Talk about a great day to do communion comments. And Brian, if you're waiting for, for the Lord and that happens, you don't get up here and read what you read. You said, did y'all see that? <laughs> Let's pray. That's what you do. Right after this, Paul holds one of the most memorable elders meetings in the, in the early church. He's in Miletus, which is about 36 miles south of Ephesus. It's a silent farming community. community. You'll get that later. Miletus is where he's at, and, and from Ephesus, he calls for the Ephesian elders to come meet him there, and here's what the word says in Acts chapter 20, verse 18. When they arrived, here's what Paul said. You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I've declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. Anybody been there? You're taking that next step in life, not knowing what's going to happen? Hmm. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now know that none of you among whom I've gone out preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I'm innocent of the blood of any of you, for I've not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. And everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself it is more blessed to give and to receive. Now you know the context of that verse. Verse 36. 
When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept, and they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Final two takeaways. In chapter 19, we, we hear the word and we hold the name of Jesus in high honor. In chapter 20, we have a faith that repents. And we commit to humble prayer. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. Will you pray with me this morning? Our Father and our God, we come before you with humble hearts. Father, recognizing that your word says that you give grace to the humble, but you oppose the proud. Father, help us not to be afraid. Help us to remember that you are with us and that you are already working in the lives of those around us. People that we come in contact with, like May Patterson, that a week ago we, we never knew even existed. But I pray for you to place those people in our lives this week. May we be that person for somebody as you call us. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it does not return void. I pray that you'll water what's been sown this morning. It's in Jesus' good name. Amen.